All right, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to our event. We will be looking at prospects for climate action at the federal, state, and county levels in 2021. We'll also share actions you can take to address the climate emergency we are in. Before we begin, as Dorcas has said, I would appreciate it if you would mute uh, yourself so that we don't have a lot of background noise and turn your video cameras off uh, for bandwidth purposes. And if you have questions for our speakers, please put them in the chat. We will be recording this meeting. It's going to go up in our YouTube channel where we have five other seminars that uh, on the climate emergency on YouTube if you would like to view them at a later date. Um, my name is Doris Nguyen. I am on the uh, Montgomery County chapter of the Climate Mobiliz Mobilization Steering Committee. We are hosting this event along with the indivisible group, Glenico Heights Mobilization. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, before we have Congressman Raskin uh, speak and uh, Delegate Charkudian and David Arkish from Public Citizen, I would like to introduce um, Margaret Klein Solomon, who, uh, Dr. Solomon, who obtained her BA in social anthropology from Harvard and her PhD in clinical psychology um, from Adelphi Phi University. Margaret founded TCM um, or the Climate Mobilization six years ago. TCM's mission is to catalyze a climate emergency movement to, in order to have a, um, to mobilize a World War II scale uh, mobilization uh, to address and reverse the um, global warming that we are having. So uh, it, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Solomon, who uh, also, by the way, has written this year a, a book called Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth to Help Readers Process the Emotional and Psychological Elements of the Climate Crisis and Rise to the Challenge of Our Time. By the way, we have, um, TCM has been responsible for over 1,700 cities across the world declaring a climate emergency uh, using TCM's policy framework. So now I'm gonna turn this to Margaret. Thank you so much, Doris. And thank you, uh, TCM Montgomery County and everyone for coming. This is really exciting. I'm um, honored and uh, really glad to be here. So, I just, I wanna kind of put uh, put some context into uh, the climate mobilization and TCM Montgomery County um, and the these climate emergency declarations. Um, okay, so I am, as Dora said, a clinical psychologist. That's my training. But about seven years ago, I had a full climate freak out as I'm sure many of you have had as well. And I, I mean, it was kind of like a conversion experience um, when my good friend told me not to just write about climate, which had been my plan. He said, don't start a blog. Discourse isn't enough. Think what you could do to actually solve this. And I was like, whoa, actually solve this emergency. And I just, I realized that I had never wanted anything more than, uh, than to, to do what I could. And I had a particular set of convictions that um, kind of became uh, the climate mobilizations paradigm, which is, uh, let's say the climate emergency climate mobilization paradigm. It's two sides of the same coin, which is, this is an existential emergency Billions of lives are on the line. We face the collapse of civilization and our food system. Like truly the stakes could not be higher, which is why we need a full scale, all hands on deck climate mobilization with the best historical analog being what we did during World War II. So it, it, the, the idea of the whole society coming together with 
all of the resources that we need to tackle this problem, this emergency, that's the vision that we brought to the table. And with the, with the understanding, especially at that time in uh, 2014, that the movement, the, the climate movement at, at, and NGOs and uh, you know what the Democratic Party was advocating and what everybody was talking about was not good enough was not even in the right uh, ballpark, right? That we needed to go like way beyond. And so that's what we've been pushing in different ways for the last six years. Some of the key things that we did is uh, Ezra Silk, co-founder of the organization wrote our victory plan, which is a uh, federal level uh, explanation of like, cause we, we kept getting the question, what do you mean World War II scale climate mobilization? What would that look like? So the victory plan lays out what it, what it could look like. It's not the only way, but it, it, it shows what, 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 would it, what would it be if our country actually got serious about protecting ourselves and humanity? So it has policies such as banning all fossil fuel expansion right? No new pipelines, no new gas hookups, no new export terminals, right? And the early retirement of existing fossil fuel capacity over a 10-year timeline. We call for banning factory farms and doing a rapid transition to uh, regenerative agriculture. So our agricultural system can sequester rather than emit carbon. Um, we have did have done various uh, largely behind the scenes strategic interventions, such as getting the need for World War II scale climate mobilization onto the 2016 Democratic Party platform. We were very involved in consulting on the Green New Deal, uh, introduced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and Ed Markey that calls for a 10 year transition through World War II scale climate mobilization um, and we are our most successful campaign to date is the climate emergency campaign. And TCM MoCo, Montgomery County, was actually a huge um, instigator of this. Montgomery County, I believe, was the third uh, locality globally to declare a climate emergency, the second in the United States, uh, Hoboken, New Jersey was the first. And it got, it, it got really good press coverage. There was like a, a long article in the Washington Post. And at, at that point, as a central organization, we were still focused on trying to find like federal level interventions. But when, after TCM MoCo did this, it really got us saying like, wow, this was really a, an effective intervention. That they, that they did. This has really kind of moved the ball forward locally and in the larger conversation. So we decided to really invest in it. And especially in California, starting in the Bay Area, we got a, a wave of climate emergency declarations. And then through uh, spreading the idea to other organizations, such as particularly Extinction Rebellion, uh, there are 1800 global governments that have declared a climate emergency. Most recently, Japan declared a climate emergency, which is very cool. Um, 125 cities in the United States. And in, in all of these declarations, there's a huge range from being really excellent opportunities for the city or the government to like reset their climate approach and to actually take the climate emergency paradigm. More than 25 cities in the United States have set a 2030 zero emissions by 2030 deadline with their climate emergency declaration. Um, some, some declarations are extremely weak. Uh, Canada declared a climate emergency and then uh, approved uh, pipeline construction the next day. Um, so it's not a cure-all, but we have seen some it, it be a real catalyst. The, uh, the one other example I want to give is the gas ban on new construction. After Berkeley, California declared a climate emergency, they, they passed a 
ban on gas hookups in new construction. So if you want to build a new house or office building in Berkeley, California, you can't have gas heating or a gas stove. Um, and that ban spread to over 20 cities in California and Massachusetts. And we know from uh, that the gas industry was actually really surprised, right? What is this? What's happening? And so it, what, and, and the answer is what's happening is if you understand that this is an emergency, of course you ban gas and any fossil fuel every chance you get. I, I mean, so, so uh, the climate mobilization is currently focused on um, moving uh, climate emergency programs. We want to take the next step and really help uh, cities institute uh, like a full climate emergency program and help them develop develop those policies and build power for them on a local level. And yeah, I think Montgomery County, you guys are leading the way. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Oh, actually, sorry. There's one more thing I want to say, which is I, I personally am pivoting back to climate psychology as much as possible following my book, which is a self-help book, Facing the Climate Emergency, How to Transform Yourself with Climate Truth. Um, I, yeah, I think that it, the, the emotional side is, um, I, I think it's the, the next big thing um, for me anyway. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop a link in the chat where you can download a chapter of that book. Um, if you're freaked out about the climate emergency, it can help. Um, Thank you very much, Margaret. Thanks, Doris. Thanks for getting the context. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna introduce Herb Simmons from uh, the Montgomery County chapter for just a minute on our activities. Okay. Uh, thanks, Doris. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And um, I just wanted to first acknowledge the role that Congressman Raskin has played in, in, in introducing the first um, resolution that actually talks about climate restoration on Earth Day last year to restoring a safe climate uh, like we had some of us of a certain age remember when we were, when we were children there a stable climate which requires removing something like a trillion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to reduce our concentrations from 300 parts or two 300 parts per million from the catastrophic level that we are today of 412. So thank you for that, Congressman. And the Climate Mobilization Montgomery County chapter uh, was founded in the summer of 2017 and obviously directly inspired by the work that Margaret um, has done and that she talked about today. And we had the audacious goal of convincing our county to declare the first climate emergency. Actually, I, I, I read the Hoboken resolution. It doesn't say climate emergency. So I still think we were first in the country and only the second on the entire planet. Within just six months, we achieved that goal as the county council unanimously declared an emergency and committed to an 80% greenhouse gas reduction goal by 2027, just seven years from now and to the large scale removal of CO2 from the atmosphere that's also critically needed to achieve a safe climate. These were the most ambitious greenhouse gas targets set by any government or any other entity in the entire country. The county though, astonishingly and sadly, however, has taken three long years just to formulate a plan of action to implement that emergency declaration. And that's a period of time almost as long as the United States fought in World War II. Um, the good news is the draft plan, plan of action will finally be released next month. We were told the first half of December. And we ask you, all those who are on this call, to join with us in reviewing and critiquing this document to ensure that it becomes the best climate action plan in the country. And that most importantly, that it's rapidly and fully implemented next year, early next year, by the council and by the county executive. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Doris, and what will be a, a very exciting webinar today. Thank you very much, Herb. And now to introduce uh, speaker, Congressman Jamie Raskin. I want to thank you, Cong Congressman Raskin, for being um, such a strong advocate for uh, progressive values in District 8 and for your leadership on climate. 
Uh, Congressman Raskin, before entering Congress, was a professor of constitutional law for 25 years at American University, a Maryland state senator, and an author of several books. He was a graduate of Harvard College and law school. He's a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal and been, at a, and been at the forefront of efforts to pass a carbon tax, to clean up water and air pollution, to restore the Chesapeake Bay, to end offshore drilling, to promote sustainable agriculture, to invest in renewable energy, to phase out single-use plastics, and to reform the Federal, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Congressman Raskin is in his second term, on several, is on several committees, and a member of the House Democratic Leadership Team. I think this makes Congressman Raskin well qualified to address the federal landscape uh, for climate action in 2021. Congressman Raskin. Doris, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and for your kind words. Uh, and hello to everybody in, at the uh, climate mobilization in Montgomery County. Thank you, Herb Simmons, for your great work too. Uh, thank you, Delegate Laura Charcutian, uh, Margaret Salmon, uh, my friend and my neighbor, David Arkush. Thank you all uh, for what you're doing um, to, uh, take care of the barricades uh, defending both democracy and our climate system. And I wanna start just by saluting everybody on this call for everything that they did in this last election, because we know uh, if we don't defend our democracy and we don't take the political system seriously, we have no hope of uh, being victorious with respect to our ecosystem um, and uh, getting to uh, zero carbon emissions by 2030, which is clearly what we need to do in order uh, to save our species on the, the planet. Um, so uh, thank you for what you all have done uh, on the side of defending democracy against the right-wing authoritarianism and the environmental, the anti-environmental extremism of the Trump administration. Uh, we have seen uh, not just the nightmare of COVID-19 and a quarter, of our mil a quarter million of our people lost uh, and uh, the wreckage in our economy, but we've also seen uh, deliberate destruction of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, uh, the censorship of the words climate change and climate science uh, in the federal government. You know, I represent tens of thousands of federal employees and this began right at the beginning and it's going all the way up to the end, the war against science uh, at NOAA, at FDA, at NIH, at all of the great scientific installations um, in our district. Um, so, uh, but we, uh, we got more than 6 million votes uh, than Donald Trump did. And uh, that is uh, an important historic breakthrough uh, victory and we shouldn't understate its meaning. Unfortunately, it's accompanied by uh, a loss of somewhere around nine or 10 seats in the House. So we have a majority, but a weakened majority in the House. And of course, uh, the fate of the US Senate uh, is still up for grabs. The wheel is still in spin with um, the, uh, the election of two more senators from Georgia. So the eyes of the country are there and I'm participating actively there. And I hope everybody continues uh, the activism of 2020 all the way through this election. Um, so I think we have to plan uh, at the federal level, both for the best case scenario, which is uh, that we have democratic control of not just the White House and the House, but also the Senate, as well as the worst case scenario, which is a razor thin majority in the House and uh, a failure to take back the Senate. Um, and um, Look, here would be our ambitious agenda, which I think both the executive branch and Democrats in Congress could uh, agree on immediately. One, of course, to uh, restore American leadership in the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, we went from being um, a leader uh, with President Obama uh, on climate change and an active participant in the Paris Climate Accords to becoming an international environmental pariah state, an environmental outlaw state, um, nothing like it on earth, uh, a state which is the sworn enemy of climate science um, and doing everything in its power to deregulate the carbon industries 
uh, and to basically turn the clock back in terms of the progress made. So this is something that can be accomplished uh, by the stroke of a pen The President-elect uh, Biden can determine immediately, I hope he does it on day one, to uh, rejoin the Paris Climate Accord and to engage in collective international action uh, to combat uh, the climate threat. The second thing is uh, we need a massive infrastructural investment in the clean energy systems, in uh, solar energy, in wind energy, and all of the renewable energy systems that will be our salvation as we quickly and I hope responsibly wean ourselves away from uh, the carbon systems and take care of the people whose livelihood and whose jobs depend right now on carbon. <clears throat> um, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have talked about a true $2 trillion investment uh, in clean energy, and that is absolutely necessary. I hope that we would be able to uh, pass uh, across the board targets of zero emissions by 2030. I got, that was something I got to work on in the Maryland State Senate. I hope that we can do it uh, at the federal level uh, as we decarbonize electricity, uh, dramatically reducing the role of carbon in our uh, energy portfolio. Again, something that we've seen happen in Maryland and also at states across the country. Um, and then in order to meet our goals and to uh, transform our energy economy, we will need uh, either a carbon tax or a carbon dividend, some social wide system to um, disengage from the carbon economy and to put that money um, into new systems and in supporting the population in the transition uh, away from the carbon energy system. So that would be an ambitious but realistic um, agenda that we could accomplish in the event that we controlled the whole government. Now, um, what if we don't? Uh, what happens if the Senate is stuck and we've got uh, Mitch McConnell still in control? Well, we can obviously continue on the administrative front to reverse all of the terrible uh, energy related executive orders that uh, Donald Trump issued while he was in office. That's something that can be done with the stroke of a pen. We can use the bully pulpit of the presidency, and I hope. Uh, and trust Joe Biden will, to work with the states, to continue to challenge the states to be making uh, forward momentum. And then we can try our best to work across the aisle to see what we can figure out uh, with the Republicans. I'll tell you uh, one little story of uh, some modest success that I had with uh, a Republican congressman um, uh, whom I like very much. Uh, it, from uh, the 116th Congress, uh, rather the 115th Congress, two Congresses ago, um, Lamar Smith, who was the chair of the House Committee on Science and Technology. And, you know, I uh, try to reach out however I can to Republicans in Annapolis uh, when I was the Senate Majority Whip and I got to lead the fight for marriage equality and to abolish the death penalty and um, to abolish mandatory minimum sentences and drug cases and so on, uh, decriminalize marijuana. We got Republicans involved. So that's very much second nature to me to try to reach out and find Republican support. So anyway, this guy was my friend, Lamar Smith. And one day we were in the committee and I said to him in judiciary, and I said, uh, Lamar, uh, you know, we can disagree about your terrible tax plan. We can disagree about reproductive freedom, but on uh, climate change, you guys have got to get serious because um, you are endangering the future of the human species and we're getting record drought and we're having record flooding and we're losing millions of acres uh, to forest fire in the West and the glaciers are collapsing and the polar bears are drowning and the walruses are vanishing and there are mosquitoes up in the North Pole now. And anyway, I went through the whole thing and I said, so you've got to get serious. He says, well, he had a great Southern accent in Texas. He said, well, Jamie said, you got your scientists and we got our scientists. And I said, Lamar, that's not how science works. It's not rival partisan teams. You know, like this is, uh, a, this is scientific knowledge and understanding. And so I took him, we we're in front of a computer and I took him to the websites 
of all of the great scientific installations in the 8th District. So NOAA and NIH and the Naval Surface Research Labs, everything. And I said, let's go and look and see what they're saying about climate change. And all of them have these long extended discussions of the reality of climate change, the dangers of climate change. And I said, you see, Lamar, all of the professionals agree about this. And so here's what he said to me. He said, well, Jamie, I don't wanna get in a big fight with you, but I just wanna tell you that professionals built the Titanic, amateurs built Noah's Ark. Okay, let that sink in for a second. And that's coming from a good guy from Texas, who's the chair of the House Committee on Science and Technology. But I kept working on him and I, I gave him uh, Bill McKibben's books and I gave him a bunch of climate change books. And then one day I got an email from him and uh, I think it was in, yeah, it must have been in maybe February or March of 2018. And, and he said, you know, dear Jamie, please see the two attachments. So one attachment was Lamar Smith changes tune on climate change. And he, he'd given a speech in which he said he agreed that climate change was real and was a real threat to us. He didn't necessarily accept it was human cause, but he said it, it was for real. The other attachment I clicked on said, Lamar Smith announces retirement from Congress. Um, all of which is to say, well, uh, you can make some progress with some of the Republicans, but it is the orthodoxy and the dogma within the Republican party that climate change is not real. It's some kind of hoax. You know, uh, Trump said it was a hoax perpetrated on the Americans by the Chinese. Whereas we know now that Donald Trump was the hoax perpetrated on the Americans by the Russians. But in any event, they, they don't think it's real. And we literally don't have enough time to educate all of them. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And I'm, you know, and uh, uh, I, the, the, the nice postscript to the story is that Lamar Smith, uh, he made his retirement and he had money left over in his account. And he sent me a thousand dollars to my campaign and that meant a lot to me. Um, but having said that, nothing is going to be able to substitute for political victory because um, it's just going to be too slow to educate people right now who are locked in that kind of dogmatic denial of the reality of the situation. So we, we keep trying, um, but we got to win those seats and we got to keep pushing forward and we got to make whatever progress we can at the state level, at the county level. Uh, thanks to the, uh, my great colleagues at the Montgomery uh, County Council and the executive who, you know, who did the climate emergency. Um, and uh, we've got to keep educating uh, the public about it. So uh, we know that the threats are overwhelming at this point. Uh, I read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, and one of the key indicators of collapse of a civilization is whether you have a governmental system that serves the interests of one small group or sector, here it would be the carbon industry, as opposed to the needs and the priorities and the values of all of the people. And so I think that's where we are. We can head down the road, which Donald Trump has taken us pretty far down towards being a failed state. A failed state is one that does not meet, meet the basic needs uh, and goods of the population. So we are not defending the population against disease. We lead the world in COVID-19 deaths and in COVID-19 cases, we lead the world in COVID-19 disinformation and propaganda. Uh, it, we're not protecting the population against the dangers of climate change as we see them bearing down on us in everything from the forest fires to the hurricanes, to the erosion and so on. Um, a failed state in terms of not guaranteeing equal administration of the laws to all, but rather allowing racism to distort public policy. So that's one road, or we can go down the road towards a new reconstruction, multiracial, multicultural progress for all Americans at the same time, yeah, linking up with other countries and making the kinds of uh, investments that Margaret talked about a World War, World, War, World War II style mobilization of the population to confront climate change that can bring us together uh, with something like a Green New Deal, which I'm a proud co-sponsor of, but it doesn't necessarily have to have that name. Uh, we can tell the Republicans, we can give it a different name, but we need a massive infrastructure investment plan that advances rather than undermines our environmental uh, urgent priorities that we've got. So 
Um, obviously, the period we're moving into is of utmost urgency and importance. And uh, I want to thank you all for your activism. It is the activism uh, that is going to save us. And Maryland is providing a lot of leadership. And let's keep it up and let's step it up as we move into the new period. And I yield back to you, Doris. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Rask. And we're going to now take about 10 minutes to have a delegate, Laura Charcudian and David Arkush from Private Citizen engage with you in a conversation and respond to what you've been saying. So Delegate Charcudian and David Arkush. All right, hi there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers. This is a, a great piece. Thank you, Congressman Raskin. It's always such a pleasure to be in the same space as you, even when it's um, virtual. And uh, David, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say as well. I also want to thank everybody on this call, um, on this on this Zoom, and I'm scanning the names, and I, I can see, I know so many names that I've seen in Rockville, in Annapolis, uh, in D.C., marching, uh, lobbying, doing all the good work that gets us, uh, that, that's going to make us progress. It is ultimately the people's movements that's going to change policy. And it's it's really, that's what always has and that's what always will. And it's our job to um, to be to be leading from that place with you. Um, so I want to just throw out a few other things. Jamie, I wonder if you want to kind of speak to these, David, uh, as well, kind of big picture stuff. I think in a few moments, I'm going to be speaking about state level policy specifically. But while we're thinking about where we are um, kind of more globally, I want to highlight a couple of things that I think are significant for this moment in time. And I want to start with talking about the reckoning um, that we are having around race in this country that um, you know, many of us have worked on for a very long time. And many of us, um, you know, in, in some ways, it's, it's uh, disheartening to see the, uh, what appears to be sort of sudden awareness um, when these issues have really been what our country has been built on the racism, um, but just connecting it to environmental justice that has to be sort of front and center in all of our work, um, but specifically to the fact that really when you look at the climate change issues, a lot of them really come about from the fact that we have policies that allow some people to be expendable and specifically black and brown people, indigenous people. And so, you know, what, the, the way that we have, we wouldn't, the fossil fuel industry as a whole is based on a disregard for the planet, but specifically a disregard for certain communities, black and brown communities that some people call, and I think appropriately call sacrifice zones, um, disregard for indigenous lands. And that we, you know, that the, the two issues are interrelated. And often we look at environmental justice from the perspective of the communities that are more affected and the need to make sure our investments address um, and prioritize investing in healing um, and improving um, those communities. Um, but I think it's also really important to, to really understand the broader um, problem of climate change coming out of uh, policies and a history and a country that's built on racism. So I wanna highlight that piece of it. And the other piece I just wanna take a minute that's I think is connected is as we're looking at the COVID um, disproportionality in, um, in, in who's affected by, uh, by, by COVID again, um, you know, uh, along racial lines, lower income communities being more disproportionately affected. And then if you look at that science really that's tied to, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of studies that tie it actually to the communities that have greater exposure to fossil fuel, um, to, the, to, to fossil fuel pollution. Um, and so, so again, you know, these pieces, the public health and the, and the environmental um, kind of interconnections. And, and then finally, I would just highlight this, COVID uh, really as, um, uh, I don't know, the, the preview or the practice of what international catastrophe looks like, but it pales in comparison to what the climate catastrophe um, will look like. And so really it's our warning, it's our chance to um, think about how do we really do things differently, um, radically differently than we're doing them now, because um, this has shown us what it looks like to be brought to our knees and it's nothing compared to if we let climate change um, continue out of control. So I'd be interested in, in all your thoughts on, on some of those, those issues as well. Are we taking responses first or am I speaking first? 
Go ahead if you'd like to. Uh... All right, thanks. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say thank you also. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here with, with Jamie and with Laura, uh, with such great climate leaders, with all of you. Um, thank you to Herb. Uh, good to see you. Thank you, Doris. Good to see you again. Um, uh, Following on what Lord was just saying, um, I couldn't agree more, and I, I appreciate you bringing up the racial justice element and climate change. Um, you know, things like coal-fired coal power plants are dirty and dangerous, even if you set aside climate change. Right? Same with fracking. Um, and you know, simply put, if if we if coal-fired power plants had to be placed in wealthy white neighborhoods, we would not be in the situation we're in right now on climate. We would have solved. We would have moved to 100% renewable electricity 20 years ago. Um, it couldn't be clearer that uh, the current system is 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 based on a disregard for a lot of people's lives, um, and and those people um, deserve justice, and they need to be centered in our efforts moving forward. Um, and that's both good policy. And that's the right policy and the moral policy. It's also good politics, right? We need um, the strongest, most diverse broadest possible coalition to get what we need on climate. Um, we need a stronger coalition than we should because of the power of the fossil fuel industry, right? They have the system rigged in their favor. Uh, and, and, and there's only something, you know, we can complain about that as long as we want. Um, but at some point it's on us, right? And that just means we have to organize better, we have to be bigger, we have to be stronger, um, and we have to be unified. Um, and so we need to reach out to everybody and uh, especially communities that have been marginalized for a very long time and who have been hurt worst. Uh, by fossil fuel extraction uh, and combustion. Um, I'm curious, uh, Jamie, I liked hearing your um, story about Lamar Smith. I would have never suspected that behind the scenes you were having nice conversations with him about climate. Uh, just by way of background for everybody, if they don't know, he was the, uh, the chair of the House Science Committee and was you know, using that position uh, to uh, do dastardly things on climate science. Um, he, you know, he wasn't just an average run-of-the-mill Republican who, was a, who, who didn't uh, believe in, in, in climate change. He was in a position of power on science itself. Um, very interesting to hear, and I'm glad to hear he had a conversion somewhat suspiciously timed around his retirement from Congress. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm glad he changed his mind. Anyway, uh, following on, so one of the things I'm going to borrow from my remarks later, which is good because we're probably going to be running behind schedule. Um, it is commonly thought that one of the best ways to reach out to Republicans is uh, with policies like a carbon tax. I think that's mistaken um, for a couple of reasons. One is almost all of them, you know, have, have actually pledged to impose all new taxes. So I don't, you know, there's, there's now that you can get into the details, it's, you know, you can get a revenue neutral carbon tax, et cetera, et cetera. But I think at a gut level, uh, there's strong Republican opposition to taxes, and I think it's um, it's a mistake to think that that's uh, that's going to be the best way to get them on board. Um, my thought is that the way to get them on board is with something else you talked about, which is investments. Right? I think that everybody likes to be able to take um, uh, infrastructure projects home to their district. Everybody likes to be able to bring broad, uh, jobs home to their district, and 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 this isn't just me talking. I've heard this from some uh, Democratic senators that when they talk to Republicans behind closed doors who are sim somewhat sympathetic to climate but feel you know hemmed in by their party's politics, the thing that gets the most traction actually is uh, is sort of green oriented investments because everybody likes those. Um, and I'm curious if you if you could speak to that a little bit, Jamie. Well, thanks to you both, and David. Let me start with you. Um, I know you just recently co-authored this excellent report about climate leading stimulus investments that could be made, and that's totally the right way to think about it. Um, you know, because there are, um, well, obviously the Republicans are are only going to be motivated really about environmental protection if you can demonstrate the the economic stimulus effect. But even with a lot of Democrats, as you're saying. Um, that's going to be the, the most popular and attractive way for people to go. So I think we've got to demonstrate to people that there's a world of opportunity for the unemployed. There's a world of opportunity for left behind communities. There's a world of opportunity for everybody if we make the infrastructural investments that we need in alternative energy systems to you know, dethrone um, the carbon kings and to break 
uh, our dependence on fossil fuels. So um, I think that that's going to be very promising. Um, and, um, you know, I, I want to uh, introduce in this new Congress uh, legislation that would basically cut off all um, subsidies to big carbon, but then to use the money that we're saving to put into, as you're suggesting, uh, economic stimulating uh, activities along safe energy and conservation lines uh, across the country. Um, so um, let's see. So Lorig, thank you so much for, for your, your comments and your thoughts. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, the communities that have been so selectively disproportionately affected by big coal and uh, the dirty carbon polluting industries um, are the ones uh, that we need to start with in terms of environmental economic stimulus to turn things around. Like that's where our green infrastructure uh, efforts need to begin in the places that have been most hard hit uh, by environmental racism and the toxic poisoning of the human environment. So I'm totally with you on that. Um, and um, look, once we open our minds up to the idea that if we get over a kind of a scarcity model and we recognize as we've seen in uh, the COVID-19 crisis that the money is there when we need the money. I mean, that's something that the right wing has always known, right? The money's always there for things we don't really need like the war in Iraq. You know, they never say, well, where are you gonna get a trillion dollars for another oil war? They just, they generate it, they produce it. Um, we need uh, massive public investment in the things that are gonna save us like regenerative agriculture, um, like CO2 removal technologies. Um, and I'm with Lorik on this, that we've got to view COVID-19 as a really important learning opportunity for us. It's, it's, a, it's an important object lesson in how a, a neglected, silent, invisible threat can bring your economy and your society to its knees. And the destruction of social life and family life uh, and community life and commerce is unbelievable what we have uh, witnessed under the lethal uh, negligence and indifference and recklessness of the Trump administration. But also conversely, the positive side of it is that COVID-19 can be the positive parts of it, which we're about to see unleashed with a real president and a, a real administration, a real government. The positive part of it is that this can be a dress rehearsal for the kind of full-scale social mobilization that we're gonna to need to address climate change in a serious way. That can be an exciting process. That can say to all these wonderful young people who've woken up and learned something that I certainly didn't know when I was a young person, which is that democracy is not some kind of uh, divinely appointed gift that is just gonna be with you forever. You gotta fight for it every single day, right? And these young people understand that and they wanna fight and they wanna fight the racism with Black Lives Matter and they wanna fight the anti-Semitism, and they wanna fight the sexism and they wanna fight uh, climate change. And so we can put into place the programs that allow huge numbers of people, millions of people to be involved in this struggle. So that's why I like very much how Margaret kicked us off uh, by talking about uh, a level of social organizing that is equal to what happened in World War II, where we had that sense of purpose and devotion. All right, thank you, uh, Congressman Rask. We're gonna take um, a few more questions from the chat next. Um, Andy, do you have some questions lined up? Yeah, I do. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman Jamie Raskin, and also uh, Delegate Charcudian and, and David Arkush for what's already been a a great conversation. And yeah, I was hoping to dive uh, right into a topic that you just brought up. So yeah, so these, this climate stimulus investments, this sounds like an, a fantastic carrot, essentially, that we're desperately needing. We're really hungry right now for, for uh, something, something uh, positive, 
positive investments. Um, but what about uh, the other the other side, which is um, uh, averting risk? Because uh, the armed services designates climate change as a national security risk, and someone when in the chat was wondering. Isn't, isn't this something that can um, really hit home for Republicans? Um, but also I was thinking more generally, um, the US military has a huge, is almost a nexus in this issue because they're one of the largest emitters in world history, um, emitting more than 140 countries. So um, potentially they would have a huge space to reduce emissions Alternatively, their funding could be decreased, freeing up enormous amounts of funds on the order of trillions of dollars. Or finally, they could potentially, um, the, the same people, these soldiers who are ordinary Americans or, or not extraordinary Americans in some ways, um, could pivot to protecting us through disaster relief, building infrastructure, or doing natural carbon sequestration such as um, planting trees. So that's a lot of ideas, but um, I was wondering uh, if, if uh, what, are, what are the thoughts on um, how the military is a cent actually a, a nexus, a, co a core part of this dilemma? Well, let, let me take a, a, quick, uh, a quick stab at it. And uh, thank you for that wonderful question. On the first point about you know, motivating people around the risks, there's clearly a significant part of the population that is motivated uh, by the risk that looks at the nightmare of millions of acres of, um, of forest being consumed by wildfire in California, or looks at just these shocking uh, images of collapsing glaciers um, and is moved by it. But unfortunately, I don't think that that reaches too far across the aisle. There are a lot of people who are not motivated by uh, the risk of it. And of course, there are a lot of people um, who are dealing just with matters that are higher up on the Maslow hierarchy of need in their lives. Um, if you're unemployed, it's hard to get motivated uh, about climate change if you're just trying to figure out how to feed your family, unless we can connect the two together and we can say, we can mobilize hundreds of thousands of new jobs for people to be involved in renewable energy. And so that of course is the point of convergence between the risk and the immediate benefits uh, that we can confer upon communities by, or by um, realigning the economy and transitioning uh, to climate preparedness. In terms of that, I think that you're absolutely right that the military can go from being a huge contributor to climate change uh, to being uh, a huge defender of the environment. And that is something that the Biden administration can lead on um, without uh, having to pass something through a Republican Senate, if God forbid, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, that's something that can be done overwhelmingly just through unilateral administrative and executive action within the Pentagon in the last defense budget, which um, I voted against, but nonetheless passed, had $720 billion in it. So that's hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, expenditure. Is that money going to be spent in a way that disregards climate risk or ex exacerbates the problems? Or is it going to be spent in a way that's part of the solution? And so I would hope that there's somebody that is appointed in the Department of Defense uh, by um, soon to be President Biden, whose job it would be to put the Defense Department on the side of climate readiness and response. Thank you. Thanks. Is there another question, Andy, for Congressman Raskin? Uh, yes, and, and thank you so much for that. Um, this is a, a little bit more of a specific one. Uh, it says, what is the likelihood of an agriculture that would include funds to encourage agrivoltaics and regenerative agriculture throughout the country. What would it take to promote those changes through an ag bill? Well, we, uh, it's interesting that you raise that because there's, there's an election going on now for a new chair of the House Agriculture 
committee because the the current chair just lost his election uh, in Minnesota, Scott Peterson. And so um, there are two candidates, David Scott and Jim Costa, and I asked both of them about that and put climate change up front and center and regenerative agriculture and, uh, uh, and being a vegetarian also uh, breaking from uh, massive public investment in uh, the livestock industry and the meat industry, which of course is a, uh, a major contributor also to climate change. So um, all of them, you know, both of them seem to be very responsive uh, to it. Of course, we got to get through the Senate too. So, you know, all of these wonderful questions about what are the chances of our being able to do X, Y, or Z, whatever it might be, um, ask yourself first, are we dealing with a Republican Senate or a Democratic Senate? If there's a Democratic Senate, we got a fighting chance of getting all this good stuff done. If it's a Republican Senate, I'd say um, we have vanishingly small odds of making anything happen uh, legislated with them. And I, I say that after the painful experience of you know just sitting through four years of Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell in the last two years when we won the House back 235 to 200, we put more than 600 bills on Mitch McConnell's desk, everything from great climate change and environmental legislation to the $15 minimum wage, to abolishing uh, gerrymandered districts and, and instituting independent nonpartisan redistricting commissions to universal background check for violent criminals and the sale of firearms. And um, you know, you name it, we've got great legislation that's just sitting there on McConnell's desk. And I, I think, you know, after four years of this, we can't kid ourselves. Um, you know, McConnell said when Obama was president, his number, he said on the first day of the Obama administration, his number one goal was to thwart and defeat everything that Obama wanted to do. And we saw you know, under four years of Trump and McConnell, them also try to turn the clock back on everything. Um, so, you know, the, the situation is serious enough. We've got to do everything we can, as people are saying, to reach across the aisle and find bipartisan coalition. But we also have to face the facts and not give people false hope. Um, they really uh, are in the business of climate denialism. Uh, and uh, they are trying to enshrine and sacralize uh, the oil and gas and coal industries. That's it. I mean, and it's, it's a business model for them. It's a political model for them, uh, and it's an energy and environmental model. Uh, and we just have to continue to educate, persuade, move, and organize the country in another direction. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thanks for giving us yeah, really a, a vision of the landscape or a, 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 an accurate view of the landscape. And I wanted to, um, I have one quick question that you can touch on if, uh, if you feel it's relevant, these, these are both from the chat or, or one that's from the chat. Um, and then one, one question that relates uh, probably maybe all, all three uh, folks can chime in on this one. Uh, so the first one is specific. It says, what, um, can Congress subsidize concrete production that capture carbon and a, uh, as opposed to releasing large amounts of CO2? Processes such as carbon cure and carbocrete and then the, that's just a specific question. And then a more general question that I hope everyone can chime in a tiny bit on is, what should be done at the local and state levels regarding the federal level? What roles for citizens coming up? What can citizens, the state and the county do to support what is being done at the federal level? Just on the first one, my answer to that is yes. There, there might be some bipartisan support for CO2 capture um, technologies. Um, and I would say that's something that might be slightly less ideological. I know there are some Republicans that just want to deny that there's a problem with the levels of CO2 uh, density um, in the atmosphere. Uh, but there are others who would take that seriously. And since it doesn't involve um, you know, alternative uh, energy systems, uh, and in some sense, you know, you could make sort of a, a critique of it that it kind of, it's a, it's a cleanup operation that we're trying to build in for the continuing nightmare of 
carbon emissions. But regardless of that, I, I think there might be some promise there. And I, I thank you for raising that because that's something where we conceivably could find some bipartisan cross fertilization. And I'll let uh, Laura and, and David tackle what can be done at the state and local level now. Sorry, and, and just to specify that's uh yeah, state and local level, but um with a view toward the federal level. And and, and I think in the in the oh. in the following QA we'll uh we'll have uh more about Maryland specifically. Okay, well yeah, but let me just say one word about it then. I think that President Biden should use the bully pulpit to urge governors and mayors and county councils and legislatures across the country to continue the forward progress. Uh, and that you know, we're gonna do whatever we can at the federal level. Uh, through legislation, if we, we have a good legislative uh, lineup of the stars, uh, but certainly in the executive branch. And there are different kinds of uh, incentive systems and partnerships that the federal government can engage in. But here, yeah, I think um, that President Biden will really need to set forth uh, a visionary statement of how central this is to us. I was very cheered and moved by uh, his statement in the final debate about how we're gonna to have to break away from the carbon system. I don't think that that was a mistake. I don't think that was a, a faux pas or slip of the tongue or for slip or anything. I think he really thought that through and he understood, you know, the America's energy system is gonna to have to look very different at the end of the 21st century than what it looked like at the beginning. Great, right. thank you very much, Congressman Raskin. Um, I think I know that you need to leave at this point. So thank yeah. you very much for your participation. It was great. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Doris, Climate Mobilization, Lord David. Hang tough, everybody. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna next turn to um, Delegate Laura Charkudian uh, and her take on the state landscape for 2021 action. A little bit about her history. She is a climate um, champion at the Maryland General Assembly representing District 20. Uh, Laura received her PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University and has been the recipient of multiple awards. Currently a member of the Economic Matters Committee, Laura is a strong advocate for legislation promoting environmental justice, criminal justice reform, consumer protections, economic justice, and a sustainable food system. In addition, Delegate Charcudian is introducing a key bill for Montgomery County at the state level this year, the Community Choice Energy Bill that will allow Montgomery County to purchase renewable energy directly from producers and aggregators um, that will allow us to uh, negotiate for cleaner energy at lower prices. So thank you very much, Laurie. Great, Go ahead. thank you again. Um, thanks for the opportunity and I'll talk um, uh, a little bit about uh, a couple different bills that I have, a couple different bills that we may see, but what I wanna say is that I'm, I'm watching the chat go um, engage about this question about how do we engage Republicans and certainly at the federal level, that's a conversation that needs to be had. At the local level, I just wanna remind you that we have um, a super majority of Democrats in the state General Assembly and in Montgomery County, certainly at all Democrats in leadership. And so um, while, while the federal conversation is one, I think that the local level, the question is actually, how do you continue to hold um, those of us who are elected Democratic uh, officials accountable. And, um, and I think that's really important because I think what we've seen over the last four years and, and even before that is just the extraordinary progress that's been made has generally been made at the state level and at the local level. And that happens when we make progress at the state level. I think that's important because actually a lot of energy policy, energy generation policy is made at the state level. Um, and we know how powerful our ability to do that at the state level is because this major FERC decision um, put in place by Trump's fossil fuel puppets at FERC actually was designed to undercut states' ability to establish clean energy policy. And so that's a sort of a signal of a recognition of how important clean energy policy is at the state level. So um, 
So I just, I think that's really important. And I think when we do things at the state level, the other things we're able to do is that we can develop creative solutions, um, make progress and really set the standard. And often what we see is policies that are done effectively state at the, at the state level then can be replicated in other states and eventually become federal policy. So um, absolutely it's crucial to have the federal uh, investments in particular, massive federal investments in clean energy. But even while we're working on that, I think that I would remind folks that there's really good work that can be done at a local level. And I know that you know that, and that's why you've done the work to declare climate emergencies in, uh, in localities. So let me start by talking about community choice energy because it ties into this work that's been done on um, the climate uh, emergency at uh, in Montgomery County. Um, so Montgomery County declared a climate emergency. I see folks talking about and a little bit of frustration that it's been three years now and there still isn't a concrete plan of exactly how to get there. I think some, some um, have been following the effort. I'm not directly involved, but I, I do know that some um, concrete steps have been taken, but there are some really big ones that need to be taken that haven't yet. And one of the issues in order to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions at the county level well before the state's uh, energy policy gets us there is the question of, of the energy generation for all of the residents in this, in, this, in this county. And in order to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, Five, um, it's it's necessary to basically have the county be responsible for making the decisions about where the energy for everybody in the county is coming from. And the only way to do that is with a community choice aggregator. And the community choice aggregator enables the county to uh, do the energy purchasing on behalf of, as an opt out, on behalf of everybody in the county. Um, and what we've seen in other, other parts of the country is when a community choice aggregator is designed with a clean energy goal, it's possible to get much more quickly to 80% um, renewable, 90% renewable, 100% renewable at a price um, that is competitive with um, the, the dirty mix that's currently there. So I will be bringing back my clean uh, community choice energy uh, bill that I had last year. Um, we passed it out of the house last year in a compromise that was to enable a pilot in Montgomery County. So Montgomery County is the county that is the closest to likely uh, moving forward with a CCA. And so the bill allows that pilot. There are a lot of uh, vested corporate interests fighting against uh, this shift and in particular a shift to energy democracy, that being uh, county elected officials accountable to the people making energy decisions as opposed to um, folks in corporate boardrooms, folks accountable to shareholders making those decisions. And so um, it's a tough go, uh, but we're, we're close and we're hopeful and we think that we're gonna, um, we think we're gonna get it through this year, but please uh, stay involved. Um, so that's one bill I want to highlight. I want to come back to some of the conversations about environmental justice. Um, I want to talk about, I have a, I have a bill uh, that uh, sets a standard for 1% improvement in energy efficiency. And I just want, when we're talking about um, this uh, environmental justice piece and uh, engagement and organizing with uh, communities of color that have been most affected uh, front and center in the organizing. I think it's really important that we're looking at the multiple ways these issues affect people. And, and I think uh, Jamie talked about the hierarchy of need when people are struggling with asthma, when people are struggling with paying their rent, when people are struggling with paying their heating bill. Uh, we've got to make sure we're making the connections between that heating bill and the asthma and the energy efficiency, which is a connection to the climate. And that's what this bill does. It is, it's, um, we've made great progress in general on energy efficiency in the state through the EMPOWER uh, program, but it has been extraordinarily unequal, shamefully unequal, and our overall averages of 2% per year with an average in low-income housing of 0.04% um, in, the, in the last year that that was measured. So I have a bill that sets the standard and brings together health and safety, indoor air quality, um, uh, funding as well uh, to, to, to tie those pieces together. I um, want to highlight uh, two other bills of mine real quick, and then I want to talk about a few other bills to, to pay attention to at the state level. I saw um, a comment, a question about geothermal. I think geothermal is crucial, and I want to say that as a state, and in fact across this country, and there was a Vox article recently that talked about it as the um, technology that has real potential, and I think it has potential for a few reasons. One is it has incredible potential because um, it will, it is the the fuel, it is the, it's the system. It's not, it's a the fuel being the sun's. Um, um, the sun's uh, heat in the earth. Uh, it's the system that um, 
that can get us off of natural gas. Um, but also, interestingly enough, it is uh, because of the way that the technology works, it's also uh, peak shaving. So it um, really helps address the peak load issues, which is one of the challenges when we shift towards more and more uh, renewable, we still have peak load issues and, the, and the, a lot of our uh, Power, the, the coal-fired power plants that have stayed online have stayed on because of the uh, peak energy issues. And so shifting to more and more geothermal as well as other air source heat pumps um, is a way to address that, which also then addresses uh, bringing down uh, the cost of energy for everybody. Um, but the other really important thing about geothermal is that from a jobs perspective, a lot of the jobs in geothermal are very similar to the jobs in pipelines. And so when we're thinking about what a just transition looks like, geothermal gives us a chance to really take those jobs that we're hoping to um, shift away from building pipelines, keep those same folks employed and shift them into building out geothermal systems. Um, Massachusetts has a really interesting proposal right now to actually take the infrastructure of the natural gas um, uh, infrastructure and a, a proposal to sort of shift it to, to geothermal, which uh, it's, it's worth looking at if, if folks haven't seen that one. Um, I will mention that I have a bill related to to compost, uh, since folks are talking also about agriculture, it's an important piece is that we're addressing our waste in a way that um, creates the regenerative agricultural opportunities um, as opposed to handling our organics waste in a way that, that, that contributes to climate change. Two, uh, three other bills that I just wanna highlight that are not my bills. We do have a climate fee bill that has been um, that has been uh, actually been introduced in the last three or four years. Um, I think it's a it's a really important bill to be paying attention to. I think we've struggled. If you look across the country, there hasn't been a climate fee bill that's passed at the state level. But we need to keep keep that front and center, even as we're figuring out how to um, uh, how to eventually get one get one at the at the national level and make sure that it's done in a way. This particular bill, is, uh, Delegate Fraser Dago and Senator Kramer's bill has a rebate process that um, ensures that the vast majority of low and middle income uh, folks pay, uh, actually uh, lower income folks benefit from the, the rebate. And so, um, uh, and, and there's still money to invest in clean energy. Uh, the second bill I wanna highlight is the Climate Solutions Now bill. That's a bill that really strengthens our Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act efforts. Um, both by speeding up the pace at which we reach 60% reduction, um, increasing our energy efficiency, um, planting 5 million trees. I think uh, remembering when we're talking about uh, carbon sequestration, trees um, is a technology that's been around for a while now. So we can, we can confidently say that one works. Um, and, uh, and also has a, a, an equity and inclusion uh, work group. Um, to make sure that a percentage of the investment goes to environmental justice uh, communities and communities that have been sacrificed uh, to fossil fuels historically. And then finally, there's a, there's a public transit bill. I don't have a lot of the details on it, but I think that's really important. And it's another really important opportunity to highlight the nexus between, um, uh, uh, between uh, the environmental justice piece of it, the jobs, the economics of a community access and inclusion um, and the climate piece of it. And so, so that'll be a really important one to be paying attention to as well. I'll stop there and i um, happy to take more questions on any of those um, in the question and answer period. Great, thank you. Uh, we're gonna turn now to David Arkish. Um, David is the Director of Public Citizens Climate Program and a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. He's an expert at the climate crisis, financial regulation, and regulatory law and policy. And as uh, Congressman Raskin mentioned, he was instrumental in developing the vision for equitable climate action, a comprehensive platform of strong equitable climate policies within the US Climate Action Network. David? Thanks, Doris. Um, <clears throat> And thanks again, Mark. It's great to be on with you. And I just want to say, as someone who works on climate policy professionally, um, there have been a few times when I've had that sort of head scratching moment where I think there really ought to be a law that X, and then found out that Laura is actually working on it. And that's the law she has introduced. <laughs> um, she's got, she's, you know, really smart policy, doing the right things. Uh, really appreciate her leadership. Um, I'm going to talk about. Um, opportunities on federal policy. And I want to be absolutely clear on talking federally because a lot of what I say will not um, necessarily apply to, to a particular state, certainly not to Maryland uh, or to Montgomery County. 
Um, <clears throat> by way of background, um, as Doris just mentioned, um, I spent the last couple of years um, helping develop uh, a broad, ambitious, uh, equitable platform of climate solutions within a group called the U.S. Climate Action Network. That's a diverse network of more than 175 groups. TCM is a member. Uh, Herb was actually involved in helping with this, uh, this project. Um, a few years ago, we set out to write a climate platform that would be ambitious enough to meet what the science says is necessary while also centering and advancing racial and economic justice. We wanted to do all of that in a manner that was as consensus-based as possible also. Um, we actually did it. It was a real achievement. Uh, I'll give you the URL for the platform at the end of my uh, remarks. I don't want to give it to you now because I want to make sure you pay attention. Um, and um, one of the biggest achievements of the process was that we did get broad consensus um, particularly on the contours of what a strong climate policy should look like. We got consensus on a shocking number of specifics also, um, but sticking to the big picture, um, the, this new consensus on climate policy is that it should be centered on three things. Uh, and I've seen a couple of references here to David Roberts's work. Um, he has a great article on this actually talking about this new consensus in climate policy. The three pillars are standards, justice, and investments. So well, I'll break that down. Um, first is strong standards. Um, when I say standards, I mean things like a requirement that the electric grid be powered 100% by renewables by 2030, or that all new cars be zero emission by 2030. Uh, second is massive investments that can help meet those standards or accomplish other things that we can't do with standards. So that means things like big investments in modernizing the electric grid uh, or building out charging infrastructure for electric cars. We need to make those kinds of investments to meet our own tough standards. We'll also need to do things like electrify rail and public transit uh, and build them out massively. So these are, these are examples of investments that aren't necessarily linked to a particular standard, but that we're going to need. And again, the third prong is justice. And we've talked about this a bit. It means a few things. And one of them is that we need to take care of fossil fuel workers and their communities. There are a lot of communities that are dependent on fossil fuel extraction. You hear some about the workers. You don't hear as much about the communities. They're going to be losing their tax base. Um, they're going to be facing uh, real economic hardship uh, and we need to we need to take care of them too. Uh, and another is justice for marginalized communities, right? This um, that means a lot of things, but but um, foremost it means things like making sure the benefits of the clean energy energy transition go first to the people who have been the most harmed by fossil fuel extraction and combustion. And, and Lord was talking about that. Okay, so standards, investments, and justice. The alignment around this is a sea change. Um, until this U.S. can platform process, there was still a lot more momentum among green groups and policymakers for centering climate policy around market-based mechanisms like carbon taxes or cap and trade. Um, those have a role to play, um, uh, but uh, nowadays most people think they should play a marginal role. Um, they shouldn't be the center of climate policy. That is a great development. Um, there are a few problems with those types of policies. They're politically problematic. A lot of, um, there are a lot of environmental justice concerns with them, and they're just not strong enough anymore. It would have been one thing if we put in, uh, put in place a carbon price in 2000. It's not enough now. Um, not to get us where we need to go on the time frame we need to get there. Um, but uh, no less important, it is virtually impossible to build a winning political coalition around market-based solutions. Uh, so it's good that we're moving on a little bit. So when I think about what we can accomplish federally, I like to think about it through this lens. What can we do on each of those prongs, on, sta on standards, on investments, and on justice? I also think it makes sense to map them onto the different branches of government. So let's talk about Congress first. Um, obviously, as has been discussed, uh, a lot depends on the Senate. Um, we can overstate that, though. No matter what happens, it will be an uphill battle to get strong climate policy through the Senate, even with a slim Democratic majority. Right there are some fairly conservative Democratic senators um, who aren't going to make it easy to pass a really strong climate policy. Um, one thing that might be on the table, again, is major investments uh, and using those as a vehicle for climate policy. So again, my take, you may have heard that a carbon tax is the best way to appeal to Republicans on climate. I don't think that's right, and that's not what I've heard from some Democratic um, climate champs in the Senate. They say behind closed doors, what Republicans are interested in most is investments, and that makes sense, right? Um, we know a lot of Republicans will go on about deficits and about government spending. We also know for a lot of them, that's just a bunch of baloney. Um, they are, you know, most of them are perfectly happy to run up the deficits, largest deficits in history, when it suits their purposes. And investments can suit their purposes, right? Virtually every politician likes to bring home money for projects and jobs in their communities. 
Uh, and a lot of Republicans are fine already with tax credits and other incentives for renewables, for electric vehicles, for other things. Those are investments too. So in theory, you can also build a lot of justice into the investments, right? You can expand uh, and electrify transit in marginalized communities. Uh, same with focusing energy efficiency improvements in homes and public buildings in marginalized communities, um, and so on. So a few last things about investments. They always have the potential to be popular, but there should be even more demand than usual right now because we need a huge economic recovery package to deal with the wreckage from COVID. Right? And a green recovery plan is a great fit. Um, and politically, you can load it up with something for everyone, but we can make sure that it uh, does uh, makes huge investments that, that advance us toward the clean energy transition that we need. All this said, I would not bank on it happening, um, especially if the Republicans control the Senate, um, but even maybe even not. Um, not without massive organizing and advocacy from people like you all across the country. We have seen the McConnell playbook. He will be happy, as far as we can guess, he will be happy to burn the country down, uh, burn everything to the ground if he thinks he can pin it on Biden and win more seats in 2022. So he'll probably try to block everything and he'll probably especially try to block a strong economic recovery package. He's already saying he wants to negotiate about it. He wants to talk about it. I don't believe him for a second. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, so we need to push very hard. We're going to need lots of work. That is one major thing that um, state and local climate groups can be doing all across the country is plugging in to support um, strong uh, federal climate solutions. All right, so that's Congress. What can Biden do himself without having to worry about a Republican Senate? Potentially a lot. Um, for one, he should declare an all hands on deck government wide mobilization to mitigate the climate crisis. He should order every agency to scour its authority, its programs, its resources for what it can do to help meet aggressive science-based climate targets. We already know some specifics about what they can do though. Um, first, Biden can do a lot to stop fossil fuel development and start winding down existing operations. Um, most fossil fuel extraction in the US is on public lands or in US uh, waters. And the rest is still subject to permitting requirements and oversight on pollution and so on. The president can block um, most new development and exports, and he can put a lot of pressure on existing operations and start curtailing them. Uh, second, there may be several hundred billion dollars in money from the CARES Act that a Biden Treasury Department could steer toward justice-oriented green investments. The Trump administration knows that, and they're trying to get rid of this money at the last minute so that Biden can't use it to do good things. Um, at this moment, it looks like Trump is maybe going to succeed on that, but we'll see. Uh, third, uh, federal regulators have a lot of existing authority to make progress on standards. Uh, these are things where they don't need new laws from Congress, they already have the authorization. So a few examples, the Department of Energy can tighten up efficiency standards for appliances, building codes for federal buildings, it can make recommendations uh, for local building co codes. EPA can write tougher efficiency standards for cars that will move us more quickly toward zero emission vehicles. It also has authority to write efficiency standards for shipping and aviation. It can arguably do a lot more, maybe even set a national cap on carbon pollution. Um, the last thing I'll highlight in terms of particular things regulators can do is uh, financial regulation. So this is a sort of an emerging area, one that I'm working a lot in myself right now. Regulators who oversee banks and other financial institutions, they have a lot of power to reduce or even wind down the financing of fossil fuels. They should do it, um, both because they're, ta they're tasked with protecting financial uh, institutions and um, I'm getting a note that my sound quality is terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me see if I can fix anything on my end. We can still hear you though. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think. Can't figure out anything to do. So, so go sorry. ahead if you want to. I'll just proceed. Yep. Um, and move on to question and answers pretty soon. Yep. Yep. Uh, financial regulators. Um, uh, are supposed to protect the financial system and individual financial institutions. Well, part of protecting them is getting them out of investments in fossil fuels, which are going to lose value very rapidly as we start fixing this problem. Um, and of course, they should stop fueling the climate crisis, which is going to rebound back on them just like everyone else. Okay, I'll, fi I'll, I'll finish here with a few caveats about all of these great things that Biden can do. Writing these kinds of rules takes time and resources. Nothing's happening overnight. In many cases, the regulators will be hesitant and they'll need to be ordered or persuaded to act more assertively or more quickly than they want to. Uh, all of these moves, almost all of them, will be challenged in court, and the courts are very conservative right now. 
Um, so there's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot that people like uh, like you can do, people, uh, groups all around the country can do to support these actions by plugging into what's going on nationally. None of those challenges means we should lower our ambition. It's just all the more reason why we need, again, a strong, diverse, robust climate movement to advocate for these things um, and to make it more likely that we'll get what we want from both Congress and the executive branch. And also by building a stronger movement and moving the culture along with us, we will have some influence on the courts as well. Great, thank you very much, David. So we can turn on uh, questions on the chat. Dorcas, do you have questions for Delegate Lorig or David Arkush? I do, thank you. And I think some of the questions that have been coming up really kind of build off what Congressman Raskin was saying in terms of this is gonna take all of us um, continuing to work forward together. And I, I wanted to just ask both of you a question around the, the challenge that climate and the environmental movement has not always had a positive relationship with social and racial justice movements. So I think the question is really, what are a couple of things that we should be really focusing on in order to be more effective in outreach to black, indigenous and people of color communities? I don't know if Delegate Chokudin is on. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think, um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that I am white and not a member of a black or indigenous community or community of color myself. I mean, I, um, and I think that that's a, you know, we need to note who, who we are. And, um, and so, you know, as I answer that question, I wanna answer it with the best of kind of what I've learned. Um, in my experience, but also acknowledge that that precisely because of my lived experience, I'm not the expert to answer that question. So since I'm on this panel, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, and I do think that uh, for me personally, and um, I think it's really important that um, if you are a white person or a privileged person that you're engaging um, first by listening. I think that people know uh, their lives and their challenges. And I think while, you know, we've been talking about making the connection between, um, you know, the, the, uh, the locations where fossil fuels are combusted or extracted from, we're making the connections with health, with um, prices that people are paying for, um, uh, energy, uh, indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, uh, lack of parks, lack of healthy food, all of those things, the connections are there. But I think that um, it's really important to start by listening to leaders in the communities of color that you're looking to engage with and, um, and finding where those connections are and where the leadership is and where the attention is. Um, and then looking for the opportunities to work together. Cause I think it's, uh, if, I think it's too uh, often um, environmental organizations will sort of say, let's do outreach to get another group of people to understand why they should care about the things that I care about. Um, and I think it's, it's gotta be flipped on its head because I think that same structure, um, colonialist structure is a lot of how we got to this place to begin with. And so we need to be organizing and listening and looking for leadership um, from the communities that you might be seeking to work with um, and then finding the opportunities for collaboration and making those connections. Thank you. Um, next question. Great, thank you. And I, I have one more here. And actually this is a couple of things that have come up in one is a question about, well, why not declare a climate emergency at the state level. And I'm gonna link it to another question, which is kind of saying, well, look at California, there's a lot of climate law on the books, but what's it really gonna to take to mobilize climate emergency action? So on the one hand, having declared an emergency seat feels key, is it something we can move forward at the state level? On the other hand, what's it take to really mobilize that action uh, within the state? I think that question was for Lauren. Yeah, I think you should take that too, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, okay, my apologies. Okay, yeah, so um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I think we we see sort of both uh, climate emergencies getting declared and a, and a lack of action, and then we see action that can be taken. And I would say at this point, 
Um, whether it's de a declaration of a climate emergency or not, it's the goals that we establish around our commitment to, to reduction, but then it's the specific actions around those commitments um, that are more important. And so I would say right now it makes sense. Um, I think the state has signed on to the Paris Accord. I mean, we've taken a lot of those very public steps. And I think that at this point at the state level, there's a lot of tools at our disposal that could really make the shift. And I would suggest that we put priority on um, pressuring the state legislature to, to make those concrete changes um, as opposed, uh, I, I think, you know, not that I would disagree with the possibility of, of declaring a climate emergency, but I think that um, taking these concrete change that we, you know, we've established the goals that often come with the declaration. And I think now making the concrete changes, pushing really towards what it's going to take to meet those, uh, those goals that we've set and continuing to the Climate Solutions Now Act actually will um, speed up the, the target dates um, by which we have to, we have to reach the 60% reduction and then the 80 and then 100%. So um, I, I would say that's, that's where it makes sense to focus right now in the state. Thanks. Um, David, did you have anything to add? I think that was a great answer. Okay, great. So we have a couple minutes left, maybe one short question, and then I want to do a minute wrap up. Dorcas, is there a short question in the chat? I think we have Emily Frias online, who is going to just speak for a minute uh, to state legislative action from Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Hi, Emily. Emily. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, I'm the grassroots coordinator at Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, so I wanted to let you all know um, about our state level priorities. So LORG has already done a great job at emphasizing the Climate Solutions Now Bill. That is gonna be our top priority this session. Um, it has a lot of great things in it um, to get us where we need to go on um, our overall uh, emissions reductions targets. Um, so that is going to be our number one. Um, I, if you want a little bit more detail about that, we're going to be having a legislative preview event um, on December 17th. We haven't set up the RCP yet, but if you want to save the date. Um, and on that call, we'll also be talking about our other two priorities, which are, um, as mentioned, the David Fraser Hidalgo um, climate uh, fee bill that is going to be uh, one of our top priorities for our no new fossil fuel campaign. Um, in addition, we'll also be uh, supporting another bill that Lori is introducing that she did not mention with the PSC climate test um, and climate and labor test, which is going to be really important for our fossil fuel fights. Um, and I just want to also say that some other work that we're doing right now um, is critical focused on stopping the Eastern Shore Pipeline. Um, that is, a, if you're not aware of it, a really big pipeline project coming on the Eastern Shore. Um, so we've been engaging on the regulatory front there. Um, there's some, it's going through a prison and an HBCU on the uh, Eastern Shore. Um, and that's a big problem, um, uh, not to mention the climate effects. Um, so the, the, a lot of the, the legislative work, um, especially on the PSC climate test is also kind of under that whole campaign of stopping no, no new fossil fuels. Um, so again, if you are um, interested in learning more about those priorities, um, you can, uh, if you haven't already, join our email list. Um, I'll put our, our website in the chat, it's chesapeakeclimate.org, um, where we'll give you updates on all of the great things that we're planning this upcoming legislative session to make these bills uh, the top priority uh, in Annapolis. Um, and we really hope that you stay engaged and we'll, like I said, we'll be having an event on um, December 17th to really dig into more information about this, but I'll keep my comments really brief because I know we're kind of running low on time here. Thank you very much, Emily. So uh, I'd like to wrap up um, the session and want to ask everybody on the call uh, to look at the chat because we are inviting you to either engage with us at the Montgomery County level we also have a December 6, 4 to 5 p.m. orientation if you'd like to attend that. Um, if you'd like to participate at the state level, please also click on the appropriate link and we will be back with you in terms of how to engage at the state level. And if you're not in Maryland and would like to also start a chapter of the climate mobilization um, to declare an emergency in your jurisdiction, we also have a link there. And please just uh, reach out to us in any way if you have any questions on how to participate. Thank you very much to all for coming. We're all very excited. Uh, uh, Lorig and David, thank you very much for this really exciting um, discussion today. Thanks everybody.
Thank you. Yep.